1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 23 through 31. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, beginning at the 23rd verse. Here's what King David declares. He says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Trample before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. I'm going to add on two more verses with it. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then the trees of the forest will sing. They will sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. I want to start out by asking you this question. Why do we come here to worship? Why do we come here to worship? You see, Sunday after Sunday, 52 Sundays a year for 5, 10, 30 years, or even a whole lifetime. We get up early on Sunday morning, getting ready, getting the children dressed, driving to church in all sorts of weather, sometimes not feeling too well ourselves, worried about our health and the health of others, financial problems, dressed in our best and on our best behavior, praying prayers, greeting friends, walking in the building, singing hymns, praying prayers, reading scripture, listening to sermons, bringing our offering, taking communion, and we call it all worship. But why do we do this? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself that question? Why do we do this? Why do we worship? Why do we do those things? You see, worship is one of the major roots in the life of the believer. When I talk about worship, I'm not speaking about merely being present in a worship service. Though this plays a vital role and is a necessary part of developing your relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'm speaking about something different. According to God's word, we were created to worship. Our sole reason for being created was to worship God. In fact, in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 4, verse number 23, Jesus Christ words it this way. He says, Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. The Father is seeking worshipers. When we truly practice the act of worshiping God, we become godly, or, or more accurately, we become more like God. You see, man will usually become, or begin to resemble whatever he worships, and that will become his God. And in fact, in in the Ten Commandments, in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 3, God said, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. You see, so if we worship the human body, if all of our focus is in on the human body, we become lustful. If we worship money, we become greedy. If we worship knowledge, we become prideful. If we worship God, we become godful. Or shall I say godly? Man doesn't need to be told to worship. It's his nature to do so. You know what? We all worship. We worship something. He will always worship something or someone, even those who seek to live a life absent of God and deny any need to worship, are actually worshiping. They're worshiping themselves. Mankind needs to be taught who to worship. This is not something we know by nature. The same way that faith is a non-negotiable for a Christian, so too is worship. So what's worship? Before we can even get to what David is speaking about in Chronicles, we need to understand what he's speaking to and why he's speaking about it. 
The ark in itself has just been placed in the tent by David. The priests have been, have been called, and worship is so crucial. And he begins to tell the nation that they need to start worshiping together. And this is the song that they sang. This is a part of the song that we're going to look at today. But when we look at worship, we need to recognize that what we think about worship is not just, is only a part of it. It's not the whole picture. It's only a part of the picture. You know, we think worship is coming into this building with other believers, engaging in worship. This is known in the Bible and in the Greek as Epsuna Gauche, a Christian meeting for the purpose of worship or assembling together for worship. In other words, when Christians gather together to exalt the name of Jesus, God calls it a worship service. So what you're in right now is a worship service. But the fact that you're in this gathering doesn't mean you're worshiping. It's determined by your heart. You can come in here and you can be here in presence, but if your heart's not here, you're just here. Worship is what's in the heart. Worship is much more than just being in the building. If you stand here and just stand here like this and say, I'm putting in my time, you're not in here worshiping. You're not in here doing what God has called you to do. Worship is giving him the praise, giving him the thanksgiving, giving him the recognition of what rightly deserves. Worship in of itself is praising God. You see, praising God serves a benefit for us as well as for him. What does praising God have to do for us? Well, it takes our minds off of our problems and needs and desires. And it begins to allow us to focus on God's mercy, God's power, God's majesty, and God's love. And so I want to look at this worship service that David has taught us as we prepare for Thanksgiving. And what he tells us, and he tells in these verses, and the first thing he says, so open your Bibles if you've closed them already, to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And let's look at these verses together. Let's look at this, and starting in verse number 23. He starts off by saying, he says, sing to the Lord all the earth. God's people have a special responsibility to praise him. When? All the time. Worship is not just in this building on Sunday morning, but worship is how we praise him out there in the world so that others may see that God is real, that others may see that there's a relationship and a desire, that he's not just a one day, a one hour a week type of thing, but our God goes with us. Our God stands with us. Our God carries us when we are weak. Our God holds our hands through our problems. And he is a God who truly cares, no matter what circumstance, no matter what situation we face. And he cares so much that he cared for us that he sent his one and only son to die in our place, to give us salvation. So if you sit around the Thanksgiving table this Thursday, and you say, I don't know what to be thankful for because I've had a rough year, because I've had a lot of problems, because I've had a lot of difficulties, because I've had a lot of worries and I have a lot of fears. There is, I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is this, that Jesus still loves you. The thing that we can be thankful for is that that cross was our cross and that he paid the price on the cross for our sins and that we have been able to be saved in that way. It's good news when it's his salvation. We're not going to be able to save ourselves. So Jesus Christ came and saved us. So what does he say? He goes on in verse number 24. He says, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the people. David is back to particular address to the people of God imploring them to tell everyone of the greatness of God and his superiority above all other gods, which is anything we try to worship, anything we try to put in the place of God in our lives, anything we put there in place of where God should stand. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. So I ask you, what is God doing in your life and in the life of those around you? Have you stopped to tell others have you stopped to tell others how awesome our God truly is? Don't wait until Thursday. Why?
Because God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So let's try it. I'm going to say God is good. And you're going to say all the time. And then I'll say all the time. And you'll say God is good. Ready? God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Remember that. And now tell other people about how good our God is and all that he's done. And don't wait for the fourth Thursday in November to stop. Because why? Because the year is almost over. And if you wait till Thanksgiving to tell people about the goodness of God, you have already missed the opportunity of 10 months. And in those 10 months, he's been good. And don't wait after that Thursday to wait an entire year because what you've done then is wait 365 days to tell once again. Why? Why do we do that? Well, David says in verse number 25, he puts it this way, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. You see, everything else pales in comparison. Everything else falls inferior to that of God. And there is only one thing, and there is only one person that we should worship. And if anything takes a priority over God, that's not going to help you through your problems in life. That's not going to help you when you face those difficulties. It's not the thing that's going to be there to help you through the struggles. It is not going to cure you from the things. There is only one great physician. There is only one counselor. There is only one God who truly loves you above and beyond. There is only one who will never leave you nor forsake you. And he is with you always to the very end of the age. And that one is Jesus. So what are we to do? We're to make it genuine. It's not just praise because we have to. I mean, I remember growing up as a kid... And I love the food at Thanksgiving, just because I love to eat. I'm not a big fan of turkey. I'm not a big fan of green bay casserole. I'm not a big fan of mashed potatoes. I'm not a big fan of, maybe I didn't like the food at Thanksgiving, now that I think about it. But I like the eating part. But you know my least favorite part of Thanksgiving is I was like, oh boy, here we go. Dad's gonna have a tradition that we're gonna sit at the table. The food's gonna get cold because everybody's gotta tell what they're thankful for. And I'd, I'd have to be thinking, and you know, my whole line was always, I would always hope that I wasn't first. I would always hope that I was at least third, fourth, or maybe even fifth, because I can say, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking too. That's what I'm thankful for. But that wasn't genuine. It was just like, let's get to the food because I want to eat. The lions are still playing. And I need to shovel down the food so I can get back out there to watch the second half of the game. Because they always found out a way to have the turkey in the midst of the football game. I didn't understand that. But why do we do it? We do it to give praise because, as David says, he says this word over and over and over again. He says this word numerous times in these verses. And the word that he mentions over and over in verses 28 and 29 is he uses this word, ascribe. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring him an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. So I had to look up that word, ascribe. What does that mean? What does it mean if someone ascribes something? It's regard as belonging to. Give glory to. Give glory to who? Look into who he says that we are to ascribe to. Ascribe to the Lord. I ask you, who should be the Lord of your life? It's not the lions on Turkey Day. It's not the turkey. It's not the pumpkin pie. The Lord of our life is Jesus Christ. Is that who we make the Lord of our life? The other 364 days out of the year? So let me ask you, who is the Lord of your life? Why don't you say the name out loud? Oh, that was, okay. Let's say it. Let's try it again. Who is the Lord of your life? God. See, you know, I'm going to try it one more time. Who is the Lord of your life? God. Jesus, frankly. Who is the Lord of your life? Jesus. See, don't be afraid to say his name in church. Because if you're afraid to say it here, it's going to be even more difficult to say it out there. Where the world doesn't want to declare that name. 
where the world doesn't want to declare the name of Jesus Christ. So King David says, give to the Lord glory and strength. This is not in the sense of giving something to God that he doesn't already have. It's in the sense of crediting to God what he actually does possess or what man is often blind to. Look and see those things in your life where we stop and we've forgotten to give God the glory. We give glory to everything and to everyone else except to God. And I encourage us to stop and look and see how God was present in the things where we've seen him and in ways where we haven't even recognized that he was there, but how his presence helped us through those times in our lives. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give him glory to his name. Why? Because he deserves it. Because God is God. And God is worthy of our praise. Worship the Lord in the beauty and holiness. God's holiness, his set-apartness, has a wonderful and distinct beauty about it. It's beautiful that God is God and not man. That he is more than the greatest man or a superman. His holy love, his grace, his justice and majesty are beautiful. The basis of praise is declaring God's character and attributes in the presence of others. Let me ask you this question. How often do you brag about your kids? How often do you brag about your grandkids? How often do you brag about God? What do you brag more about? You see, bragging about God is the true meaning of worship. Why? Because our God is an awesome God. It's not that he's a cool God. He's an awesome God. And how does he show us that he's awesome? He shows us that he's awesome even by the things that he's created. He shows us he's awesome by the thing, the most valuable thing that he's created, which is you. But not only through you, but he's also shown it through other things of how awesome our God truly is. He, King David says, let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Why? Because those things show the awesome presence of God. If you're wondering if God is real, if you're wondering if God is, is, is true, then I encourage you. One of my favorite sites in all of North Dakota is driving on 49. Coming from, coming from the Bismarck or Dickinson Way back into 49. When you first see the glimpse of Beulah coming into town. And as I look at that, I stop and I recognize how truly awesome our God is. The beauty and the majesty of those rolling hills. I was always told, before I moved to North Dakota, my family, my extended family would say to me, oh, where you're going, it's really flat. You know, it's really cold and it's really flat. But I tell you, there is nothing more beautiful in my mind than seeing the presence of God by looking at those hills coming into Beulah. Creation in itself declares there is a God because there is a designer, and that designer is God himself. And what does he say? And he says, because of that, let them say among the nations, let them say among the people, let them say wherever they go, let them say these three simple words, the Lord reigns. So I'm going to have you do it again. You ready? The Lord reigns. Let's do it now together. The Lord reigns. Reigns. Now, when we look at that, you know, when we take that, I'm going to put it in a link to it today. You know what that's saying? God rocks. God rocks. He rocks. He's king. He's in control. He's in charge. He's in charge of everything. He's in charge of our life. Because why? Because he's Lord of our life. He's in control of everything. And the great thing about this king is this king has not abandoned us. This king has only gone away for a short period of time. And what King David reminds him is that he's coming back again. He's coming back again. And when he returns, he comes back in a way to bring glory and honor to the name of God. So friends, I want to encourage you to do something not just this Thursday, but to do something with every breath to do something in every way, to stop and to worship God with every breath, with every fiber of your being, because every day is worship, not just Sundays. That's the reason why we were created. That's your purpose. 
That's my purpose. That's our purpose. And in the midst of that worship, in the midst of all the busyness of the day, in the midst of the worries, in the midst of the fears, in the midst of the problems, in the midst of the difficulties, stop and give God the praise. Give him the glory. Give him the honor. For he and he alone is a God who is worthy for the praise. So as we seek him out, seek him out, as King David says elsewhere, seek him out as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul longeth after thee. Take this time, take this day, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be given unto you. Sing that song to the Lord. Sing it loud, sing it boldly, sing it clear, so that the world may know that God is good, Ah, uh, I'll preach for another 25. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Let's go forward and tell that message. Hymn number 548.